I'm sure this won't be a controversial topic. So, when you think of Ireland, unless you're from there, what are the first things that come to mind? Leprechauns, people drinking, the color green, St. Patrick, people with funny accents, the likes. But I feel like people tend to overlook a vital part of Ireland, mainly its history. Specifically, its fight against the British. Now granted, some of you are saying, Oh Berg, I totally understand that. Up da da, come out your black and tans, 32 counties, car bomb jokes, that kind of stuff. But like I said, I don't think people quite understanding seeing how Ireland's fight against British imperialism shaped it the way to it is today, and how it still showcases some of its problems that it still faces. Especially in the north. All the while, the British conquest of Ireland was shown to be a precursor and a prototype to becoming the largest empire in all of human history. Sorry, Mongols. <laughs> Today I'm going to be talking about Ireland's revolutionary history and its centuries-long battle with the British Empire. And keep in mind, I'm going to be summarizing a millennium of Irish history, so forgive me if I don't go into every detail as I'm mainly going to focus on the more important stuff. If I did that kind of video, it would be 12 hours long. I know some of you are into watching those type of videos, but I don't feel like making it. Also, another thing, throughout this video, I'm going to be using labels such as Protestant, Loyalist, and Unionist for one side, along with Catholic, Republican, and Nationalist for another interchangeably. Yes, I know there are differences between these groups and it's not as clear-sighted as there were Protestants who fought for Irish independence and Catholics who fought for the British. I made a similar statement in my old Indian Pakistan Wars video where there were Muslims that fought for India and Hindus that fought for Pakistan. But you also have to understand a lot of these points of contentions are mainly stemmed from religious and national identity. But this intro has gone on for too long, so let's get into the whole situation from here. So Ireland before British rule was actually interesting, an advanced society filled with scientific and technological wonders, but sadly fell due to the discovery of whiskey. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I had to get that stupid joke out the way. Uh, okay, real deal, real deal. Ireland was made up of several different Celtic kingdoms and tribes that fought among themselves. Despite going up to the British Isles, the Roman Empire never attempted to conquer Ireland. Because one, the seas were right at treacherous, and two, they didn't see it as worth it. Anyway, St. Patrick comes in to spread Christianity, which there's actually an irony to this. You see, St. Patty here wasn't actually Irish. He was British. No, you lie! You lie! Also, instead of green, some would say that he wore orange and red for his traditional clothing. Trust me, this will mean something later on. Anyway, Vikings start raiding and pillaging, but not much damage is done as they're being fought back. But it's business as usual until the year 1168. You see, there was this king by the name of Dermot McMorrow. McMorrow was the king of Leinster in Dublin, but was disposed of. Wanting his throne back, he went to the king of England, Henry II who was also the Duke of Normandy, a small region in northern France. Now at first, Henry wanted nothing to do with McMorrow, so McMorrow went to Richard de Clare, the Earl of Pembroke. Now Clare did agree to help McMorrow in exchange for his daughter's hand in marriage, and to succeed McMorrow after he died. So de Clare would gather an army of Anglo-Norman mercenaries to help McMorrow take back the crown. So in 1169, the Anglo-Norman mercenaries would invade Ireland, and thus McMorrow would finally get back his throne, However, he made one teeny tiny little mistake. He just started a centuries long feud between the two islands and doomed his people to British colonialism. Damn, it really be one of your own. In 1171, McMurrow dies and as promised, De Clare takes over. But King Henry II, not wanting to be upstaged by De Clare, who he saw as a rival, took over the invasion and thought it would be best to control all of Ireland. Many of the Irish kingdoms surrendered to Henry II as they thought this would stop the Anglo-Norman rampage, but it only made things worse, with Henry giving various kingdoms to English landowners and would consider the conquered territories to be the lordship of Ireland. The Irish High King, Rory O'Connor, made one last-ditch effort to stop the Anglo-Norman invasion. 
In 1175, he would propose the Treaty of Windsor, which allowed the English to keep the lands they conquered, but the rest of Ireland was off limits. As you can imagine, the treaty did not last long as English soldiers kept encroaching on this land. Because Henry II was dealing with the French, O'Connor rallied the rest of Ireland to fight the Anglo-Norman invaders, and for the next 400 years, the Irish would continuously fight off the English. This allowed the various rival Irish kingdoms to fought each other to put aside their differences and unite against the English. However, the English would keep constantly gathering land in Ireland until 1300, where the English conquered three-fourths of Ireland. However, it was during that time period that the tide would turn against the English as an invasion from Scotland from 1315 to 1318 would destroy much of the supplies causing a famine and the infamous Black Death pandemic affected many of the English settlers in Ireland as they were confined in cities. The native Irish mostly make it out mainly due to the fact that they lived in rural areas. Seeing an opportunity, the Irish would regroup and try to kick the English out of Ireland. Even some English settlers who were sympathetic to the Irish switching sides. In response to this, in 1366, the English would enact the Statues of Kilkenny. This would segregate the English settlers from the Irish natives. As the English were not allowed to intermarry with the Irish natives, adopt any Irish children, or even take part in anything that involves Irish culture. Thus making the Irish second class citizens in their own country. Huh. Why does that sound familiar? For the next 200 years, the Irish would take back their land and culture and would make a resurgence. However, in the 1500s, there were still a small sect of those who were still loyal to the English. And a couple decades later, there will be one thing that would change the future of Ireland for centuries to come. Or I should say, one person. In 1509, King Henry VIII would come to power. Now many of you probably know about this guy from about three things. One, being a rather portly fellow. Two, breaking away from the Catholic Church and three, going through the messiest of divorces in all of history. But many don't know that he was the one who officially made Ireland a British colony. As mentioned before, there were still those in Ireland who were still loyal to the English, but the divide only became worse after King Henry broke away from the Catholic Church, thus starting the divide between Catholics and Protestants, which we'll get more into that later. So we gotta talk about this guy here. This is Thomas Fitzgerald, the 10th Earl of Kilderay, or Silken Thomas as he was known as. So Fitzgerald was actually born in London and was a distant cousin of King Henry VIII. His father was arrested in London and it was rumored that he was executed, which he wasn't. Fearing the same fate for him, in 1534, Fitzgerald convinced the Irish to help him rise against the English. Fun fact, his father died after learning Thomas was rebelling against the English. Oops. So the English fought back against the rebellion and Fitzgerald surrendered and he was then executed. Which, um, talk about irony there. So Henry, having had enough, decided to finish what his namesake started over 400 years ago and take over Ireland. And in 1542, the Kingdom of Ireland would be established as a puppet state for England. However, it wouldn't be until 1603 where the English finally conquered Ireland as there were still rebellions and uprisings all over the place. During this time period, the English would try to suppress Irish culture, religion, and language and let the English and later Scottish settlers take Irish lands and turn them into plantations. Here the Protestant and British class would be given better treatment while the Catholic majority was forced out of their lands. This made some of the Catholics convert to Protestantism for better treatment, while for the Catholics it only created resentment. And this powder keg would soon explode in 1639. You see, King Charles I had some trouble controlling the British Isles as each of them had problems with each other. And thus, the British Civil War broke out, and it was a four-way battle between the Royalists who wanted to keep the monarchy, the Parliamentarians who wanted to make Britain to a republic, the Scottish Covenators who believed Scotland should rule, and the Irish Confederates who wanted Irish independence. Since most of the fighting was still on mainland Britain, the Irish took this opportunity to take back their land with about two-thirds of Ireland being back under their control. So the Royalists made a deal with the Irish Confederates, help them fight, and they can get their independence. 
They accepted, but it made the Irish a bit too ambitious as they also invaded Scotland. This allowed the Scottish to ally themselves with the Parliamentarians. Look, I'm going to be honest here, the British Civil War was such a mess that my small explanation could not do it justice as this fiasco lasted for over a decade. But to make a very long story short, in fact I think that saying can apply to this video in general, the Parliamentarians won and King Charles I was executed. Because the Irish sided with the Royalists, the Parliamentarians decided to keep the same oppressive policies in Ireland as punishment. Because of this, some of the Irish side was best to flee the country and make their way to British North America, where they would become indentured servants. Which leads me to my next thing. Yep, we're talking about this. We're talking about... SLAVERY! Oh, uh, right. I am so embarrassed. Okay, this is going to be a bit of a tangent, but still somewhat on topic. But I got to put to rest the stupid myth of people comparing Irish indentured servitude to African slavery in the Americas. Because in many conservative and right-wing circles, many would diminish the sufferings of blacks in the Americas by saying, Oh, the Irish were enslaved too, but you don't see them complaining. Which, one... No, they are complaining. They're still pissed at the British. In fact, when Queen Elizabeth died, a lot of Irish shouldn't be happy about that. And two, this is how indentured servitude actually worked. Basically, indentured servitude was voluntary. You signed away about several years of your life to work for little to no pay, and after you were done, you'd be free to live your life. Granted, yes, indentured servants were treated awfully and worked in extreme and horrible working conditions, but at the end of the day, once your contract was up and your debt was paid, you were allowed to leave and reintegrate back into society. Now, African slavery, despite being kidnapped, when they first came to the New World, were actually on equal footing, meaning they too started off as indentured servants, as they could have worked to earn their freedom. But as strict racial laws became more apparent, the black servants eventually turned to slaves. And it didn't help that after Bacon's Rebellion in 1676, where European indentured servants and African slaves worked together to try to gain their freedom, the white ruling class abolished indentured servitude and made Africans full-blown slaves in British America. Because it was easier to use the racial differences to put against each other rather than them having a common enemy, i.e. them. Because even back then, if there was one thing the ruling class hated, it was class solidarity. And there were Irish slave owners who did profit on the suffering of many Africans. However, these were mainly of the Protestant elite with a few Catholics here and there. And of course, African slavery involved taking away culture, names, language, and being told you are not human with you being beaten and having your family sold away. Now, one can argue a similar thing happened in mainland Ireland, which, yes, it did, but that's not the point of this segment. The point is just to show that, that this stupid myth is used to tell one group of marginalized people to shut up and not talk about the issues that affect them, while mitigating and disregarding the plight and suffering of another marginalized people whose issues from that still exist today. Honestly, the viewpoint is more Irish-American than Irish itself. But yeah, rant over, let's go back to mainland Ireland. Oh, then tell me, Sean In 1698, one major conflict between the Protestants and the Catholics would occur called the Williamite War, where the Catholic Irish supported the supposed English King James II as he was willing to allow more rights for Catholics, who fought against his successor, William II, or William of Orange, who wanted to promote Protestant supremacy. This war would end in a Protestant victory with it being celebrated by Protestant communities in Northern Ireland to this day, known as the 12th of July. After that, Irish rebellions would kind of stop for the next 100 years with England, now known as Great Britain, putting its control over Ireland. However, in the 1760s, several different Irish political parties would band together and would form the Irish Patriot Party, which furthered the goal of Irish independence. And in 1782, inspired by the American War for Independence, the IPP would sign the Constitution for Ireland's Independence, but this was rejected by King George III because, you know, he was not willing to lose another British colony. So after a decade of debating and inspired by the American and French revolutions, the Irish just said, screw it, and the Irish Rebellion of 1798 would happen. Ironically, it wasn't the Catholics who started the uprising, but the Presbyterians, 
who felt cheated by their fellow Protestants, the Anglicans, who didn't allow them any power. So they allied with the Catholic majority and fought against the British. Under the leadership of Theobald Wolfe Tone, who was a Protestant, the Irish rebels at first managed to gain some ground. But soon the British would bring reinforcements and push the rebels back. The French tried to support the Irish rebels by sending troops and weapons, but they really weren't much help. As the last time they supported a revolution against the British, it led to their own and on their slave colony of Haiti. Yet yeah, a lot was going on during this time period. Tone was captured, but he committed suicide in prison to avoid being punished by the British. While pockets of insurrection would persist until 1804, the Irish rebellion was crushed. The rebellion caused a lot of suffering for the Irish, as British troops would execute prisoners of war and attack civilian population, with British soldiers also pillaging towns and mass sexual assaults onto Irish women. However, the rebels also had their fair share of war crimes as well, as they would attack anyone who they considered to be loyal to the British. One incident including where somewhere between 100 and 200 Protestant men, women and children were burned and shot by Irish rebels in Eastern Ireland. So the British, having had enough and fearing that Ireland would make a useful ally for its longtime enemy France, in 1801 they would annex Ireland into the United Kingdom. So for a while, the Irish were officially British. Many Irish hoped that now that they are part of the UK, that they would be treated much better. But unfortunately, that wasn't the case. And this would definitely be seen during the infamous Irish Potato Famine. You see, the potato was quite a crucial part of the diets of many Irish at the time. In 1845, it was discovered that a fungus by the name of Phytophora infestan, better known as the blight, affected the potatoes thus destroying the main food source, leaving many to starve. The British government barely did anything as they thought the problem would work itself out, but it, it wouldn't be for another 7 years where the famine finally ended. Now I know what some of you are thinking, why didn't the Irish eat anything else? We have to understand how Ireland was back then. For starters, the thing about potatoes is that it's an easy food to plant and grow as it was done almost anywhere. The soil in Ireland wasn't good for other types of vegetables. Second, most Irish did not own their own land, so the British landowners didn't really care much for their tenants. Third, many Irish were poor and only could afford the bare minimum. Also, you have to remember meat was very expensive and rare back then. Sure, if you were lucky, you had a pig, a cow, maybe a few chickens, but it was mainly for special occasions. And plus, do you know how much work it takes to take care of those animals? Farming isn't as easy as many people think it is. While the coast fared better as there were many fishing towns, they had a hard time transporting the fish mainly to Ireland's mountain terrain. Now, under normal circumstances, all food trade would be cut off until things got back to normal, as famine was nothing new for Ireland. But the problem was, the British mainly relied on food from Ireland, so they took many of the good stuff, leaving the Irish with very little. Now, many debate if the Great Irish Famine was a genocide or not, mainly because if they're wanting it was intentional. But here's the thing. It was. The British knew what they were doing. They knew what was happening in Ireland. As I stated before, this was going on for seven years. One million people died from this. If we can rightfully classify the famines caused by the Soviet Union and Ukraine and Kazakhstan a genocide, then we should do the same for the British and the Irish potato famine. Because of this, Irish emigration grew with many Irish immigrants going to the United States, but some would ironically go to Britain and as far as Australia. It's one of the reasons why you're more likely to find someone with a last name O'Neill, McConnell, or Burke in say New York, London, or Sydney compared to say Dublin. As even to this day, Ireland's population still hasn't recovered. Because of this, and inspired by the various revolutions that were going on in Europe at the time, in July 1848, a group known as Young Irelanders who wanted freedom from Britain were revolt by trying to take over the police stations in the village of Bellingaty. However, this little rebellion was short-lived as after several hours of fighting, the rebels decided to flee. After this incident, the British finally sent help, but by then it was already too little too late. So after this whole fiasco, the Irish realized that they need to get away from the British as soon as possible. Throughout the latter half of the 19th century, the British decided to spread their influence in the other parts of the world, specifically Africa and Asia. Here they would use the same tactics that they used in Ireland to oppress the peoples of these regions. Well, after so many failed rebellions, the Irish realized that wasn't working out so well for them. So they tried a more civil approach. 
In the 1860s and 70s, the Irish Home Rule Movement would begin. At first, under the leadership of Isaac Butt, <laughs> his name is Butt, Ireland would start sending their representatives to the British Parliament to lobby for them to rule over themselves. Now, some of you may be asking, what's the difference between Home Rule and Independence? Well, independence is basically they just want to get rid of the British and have full control. While well, home rule means that they're still part of the United Kingdom, but they're basically running their own affairs. Again, this is a more simplified explanation. But soon the Irish home rule movement would get a new leader by the name of Charles Stuart Parnell. Now with Parnell's background, you would think he'd be against the home rule movement as he was born into a wealthy Protestant family. To an Anglo-Irish father and American mother, yet Parnell pushed for home rule. And his presence really made the British angry as they did everything in their path to stop the Home Rule movement as they believed the Irish weren't capable of ruling themselves. And they would run a smear campaign against the movement claiming that they supported crime and rebel groups. It even brought up Parnell's various affairs with married women thus ruining his political career. Still, the Home Rule movement persisted. However, while there were those who were advocating for Home Rule, there were Irish who were against it. Irish loyal to the British would campaign against Home Rule with it being led by Lord Edward Carson. So in 1914, the British finally decided to take a look in this whole Home Rule situation. Until one minor event happened. So a quick recap on how World War I started. Austro-Hungarian Archduke gets killed, Austria-Hungary blames a tiny Southeast European nation of Serbia and declares war on them. But Russia, being the ally of Serbia, declares war on Austria-Hungary. But Germany, being the ally of Austria-Hungary, not only declares war on Russia, but France because the latter is allied with the former. So in order to knock out France out of the war, Germany invades Belgium, which is an ally of the United Kingdom, which they declare war on Germany. I know this all sounds confusing, but think of it similar to the worst internet drama, but on a global and more catastrophic scale. The British, focusing all their attention on Germany, decided to put the home rule situation on hiatus. Still, many Irishmen joined the fight for the British during the First World War. For some, they were loyal to the British and wanted to fight for king and country. While there were others who were sympathetic to the Serbians and Belgians as they understood what it's like to be occupied by a larger European power even though the Belgians were doing the exact same imperialistic thing in the Congo. 200,000 Irish would end up fighting in the First World War, with the majority fighting Irish units. However, like many soldiers during World War I, the Irish realized that this was not going to be an easy task. As the war continued to rage, the Irish were in for a nasty surprise as they were bogged down in the stalemates of the battlefield. The Irish units would suffer heavy casualties in some of the bloodiest battles of the war, such as Gallipoli and the Somme where they would be used as cannon fodder for the enemy as entire units were almost wiped out. It didn't help that the Irish troops were given harsher treatments and punishments compared to their British counterparts, as they faced a lot of dishonorable discharges and even executions for those that disobeyed orders. These reports led their recruitment in Ireland to drop rapidly. Of the 200,000 Irish troops that fought in the First World War, it is estimated that 30,000 died. Now, compared to the other countries that fought in World War I, it seems like small potatoes. Ah, crap, did they actually make a pun? And it's rather comparable to other colonial and commonwealth troops that fought and died for the British Empire, such as 60,000 Canadians, 70,000 Australians, and 75,000 Indians who were killed during the war. But you also gotta remember that Ireland's population was and still is small. That was a good amount of men that were lost there, and they were still recovering from the famine several decades earlier. So the First World War really put a dent in Irish morale. Because of this, several Irish nationalist groups decided it was time to rise up and on April 24, 1916, with minor support from the Germans, the Easter Rising would happen. With fighting mostly done in Dublin and a few other cities here and there, but in the end, the rebellion was crushed and many of its perpetrators were executed. Later, the British would try to establish a draft since Ireland was one of the few countries that didn't have one. Angered by this, and the Easter Rising still fresh in people's minds, this inspired many Irish that it was time for their own self-rule. In December 1918, a month after World War I, Ireland had an election where the Republican Party, Sinn Féin, won the majority of the votes. He or Sinn Féin was supposed to represent the Irish in the British Parliament. But this was rejected by the British. 
Because of this, the Irish demanded their independence and would try to bring their grievances to the Paris Peace Conference. For those who don't know, the Paris Peace Conference, or at least this version of it because trust me, there are a ton of them, was where when the victorious allies decided what to do after the First World War. They tried to go to US President Woodrow Wilson who had proposed the policy of self-determination as countries under European rule had the right to their own future and governments. Problem was, Wilson only meant this for countries that were in Eastern Europe, aka the territories of the losers, and pretty much snubbed the Irish delegation along with other independence movements from the various empires. You see, despite having some Irish ancestry and even gloating about it, Wilson never cared for Irish independence and really hated the Irish. He only saw Irish Americans as a tool to use as to get him elected. No surprise since Wilson was a raging racist whose policy led to the resurgence of the Ku Klux Klan, who while African Americans were their main targets, they also went after Irish Catholics. In fact, there were two unexpected allies for Irish independence. First is the newly established Soviet Russia who just got done overthrowing their government and called for a worldwide revolution. Even though the Soviets were doing the exact same imperialistic thing in Eastern Europe and Central Asia. And the other one was Japan who proposed a racial equality law that gave equal status and independence to all people. Even though the Japanese were doing the same exact imperialistic things in China and Korea. But this was rejected by Britain as that would mean they would have to acknowledge their colonies in Africa, Asia, and Ireland as equals. So the Irish, after so much, decided enough was enough and on January 21st, 1919, with Brugda as its first president, Ireland declared its independence from Great Britain. It is here where the Irish Republican Army will be formed. However, this would lead to a certain event. So there was an incident where members of the IRA would attack officers of the Royal Irish Constabulary, killing two of them. Along with this, they also attacked some British officials and property. Now this was a really dumb decision as it gave Britain the justification to retaliate, and thus began the Irish War of Independence. Here the IRA would be under the command of Michael Collins, who would conduct raids and attacks on the British becoming a thorn in their side. They would break out political prisoners out of jails, wiping out squads of British soldiers, and sabotaging any chance for the British to get the upper hand. And by 1920, the IRA managed to get a good chunk of the country. In response, the British would do their best to crack down on the rebel, first by establishing martial law, then recruiting British soldiers who fought in the First World War and putting them in the RIC, where they would become the infamous Black and Tans, called that due to the color of their uniforms. The Black and Tans were notorious for the brutality as they would respond to IRA attacks by focusing their vengeance on the civilian population. Arson, looting, killings, and rapes were commonplace by the Black and Tans. These actions only made people even more angry and revolutionized many Irish to fight. Even in Britain, the reputation of the Black and Tans horrified the public and turned many against the war. The worst of the fighting happened in Northern Ireland, where the Catholics supported the independence movement while the Protestants supported the British. This led to a lot of sectarian fighting and violence to the point that in May 1921, the British would divide up Ireland under these lines by keeping the Protestant North in the United Kingdom. Now, if you know anything about British colonial history, is that dividing any colony by sectarian lines never ends well. Never. Ever. So after so much fighting, in July 1921, the Irish and British forces would enact a truce between each other and negotiate. Despite the truce, both sides still continue on the fight as they didn't want to be seen as weak to their respective enemies. But finally, in December 1921, the treaty between the Irish and the British would finally be signed, with the South of Ireland being its own independent state known as the Free State of Ireland with a Catholic majority, while a small bit of the North with a Protestant majority would stay in the United Kingdom. Now under normal circumstances, this is where the story would end. But as you can see, this is not the case. While many Irish were willing to accept this new treaty, others were not. See, there are those who wanted all of Ireland to be united. This would lead to a divide in the IRA. Now, there were attempts to try to appease the anti-treaty party, even trying to form a coalition government. But in the end, any measures of compromise were thrown out the window, and the pro-treaty forces became the National Army, and thus began the Irish Civil War. 
If I can find one word to describe the Irish Civil War, it would be ironic. Here Irishmen who only a year ago fought alongside each other against British rule are now killing each other over land disputes. Along with that, it was the British who supported the National Army in the Irish Free State as, you know, they didn't want a party ruling Ireland that was against the treaty. Another irony was the death of Michael Collins. As mentioned before, Collins originally led the IRA during the War of Independence, but was signed with a pro-treaty side and lead the National Army. However, in secret, he was supplying the IRA in Northern Ireland to still keep fighting the British. And in August 1922, Collins was killed in an attack by the IRA. It wasn't the British that killed him, but his own troops that he supplied and led to battle. Now that is irony. The National Army would execute IRA prisoners in rather brutal fashion, such as one event where they executed eight prisoners by tying them to landmines. The IRA would retaliate against national forces for this. And while the conflict was between the pro and anti treaty forces, the IRA still attacked former Unionists and Protestants who they believed supported the British, even though there was no evidence to the contrary. Despite the IRA having a lot of fight in them, they were outmatched by the National Army, as the Irish public, along with the Catholic Church, supported the Irish Free State, and thus the IRA were defeated, with Ireland still keeping the same borders that we see today. Despite the Civil War being short, it was a bloody event that led to more death and destruction in Ireland, where defense of the war still have an effect on the country to this day. Before we get into the next part, I want to go into another tangent to talk about the colors green, red, and orange. Now for many people, these colors probably don't mean anything since, well, they're just colors. Or at least with green, since we see it as part of some Irish thing, as most people associate it with St. Patrick's Day. And of course, Ireland itself, as it's known for its immense greenery to the point where it's earned a nickname, the Emerald Isle. But there's a lot to these colors that one would think. The green actually represents the Catholics who rose up against British rule, while the orange and to a lesser extent red represents the Protestants who stayed loyal to the British. This would definitely be seen on the modern Irish flag, with both green and orange being on there with the white representing a middle ground, coexistence between the two sects of Christianity, and having a flag represent harmony between the ethnic and religious groups is nothing new. The original flag for the South American country for Suriname had five different color stars to represent the racial groups of Blacks, Whites, East Asians, Indians, and Natives, while the original flag of the First Chinese Republic represented the groups of the Han, Manchu, Mongols, Tibetans, and Muslims. So yes, the Irish flag has some meaning to it than being your standard tricolor flag you see in 90% of European countries. But sadly, as you will see in the later part of this video, this coexistence is a lot harder to achieve than you think. Due to the amount of damage and the debt the Irish government owed, Ireland had to rely on Britain for support and had to take an oath of allegiance. In a way, Ireland was in a similar status that most white-dominated British colonies like Canada and Australia were in, mainly being part of the Commonwealth of Nations, meaning while independent, they still had to be loyal to the British monarchy. Another irony being that the Irish just fought a war of independence not too long ago. So for about a decade, Ireland would try to rebuild after the dreaded Civil War. For the IRA, they would mainly stick to Northern Ireland to protect the Catholic minority from Protestant attacks. Especially with the Great Depression happening at the time, with many people scapegoating the Catholics for their problem. Under the leadership of Amen de Valera, who was instrumental in the Irish independence movement, along with the support of the Catholic Church, the Irish would try to ease their way out of the Commonwealth for full independence from the British. This would lead to a trade war with Britain, however, because Ireland was trying to cut ties with the British, it actually saved them from another devastating war. In September 1939, Nazi Germany would invade Poland, thus starting the Second World War in Europe. Britain, along with its colonies, would go on the fight, but Ireland wanted to stay neutral, and it did. Now, at first, the British and the Germans were okay with this as they didn't see Ireland as a major threat as it was willing to work with both sides, such as returning British airmen that were shut over Ireland back to the British and even laying some Irish during the British Army. 
All the while, letting German submarines pass through their waters and even allowing Nazi spies to travel through Ireland to make their way to the United Kingdom. However, over time, both nations were eyeing the country, as the British feared that the Germans would use Ireland as a stepping stone to evade the United Kingdom, and the Germans thought Ireland would be a great distraction for the British while they used the Irish struggle against Britain for propaganda purposes. Even though the Germans were doing the exact same, you know, screw it, you already know how it is, everyone's a hypocrite. Still, the Germans would sink Irish ships and even accidentally bomb Dublin twice, mind you. The Irish were still determined to stay out of this one. The British tried hard to convince Ireland to join the war on the side of the Allies. And even though the two countries came up with a plan on what would happen if Germany invaded Ireland, the Irish still wanted to be neutral. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill even offered to have the whole of Ireland to be reunited. But the Irish refused this for two reasons. One, they rightfully didn't trust Churchill. And two, having them reunite all of a sudden will cause another civil war and many Irish were not willing to risk it. Still, despite the British offer to reunite Ireland, the IRA would make a return and end up working with the Germans. The IRA would make contact with ABVA, which was basically the Nazi version of the CIA. So basically the CIA. Now for many members of the IRA, they had split views on this. For some of them, they didn't like working with the Nazis as they saw them no better than the British. And I mean, they're not wrong on that one. Well, others had an enemy of my enemy mentality as they saw the Nazis as a way of fighting against the British. This line of thinking was common in a lot of British colonial troops who joined the Germans. In fact, I go more into detail about this in one of my older videos right here. And sad to say, there were some who did support the Nazi cause, believing the British government was under the control of the Jews. So from 1942 to 1944, the IRA would conduct attacks on British and Northern Irish security forces. But these attacks did very little damage and were barely a blimp on the British radar as they were mainly focusing on their intention on fighting the Germans in Europe. So the IRA was beaten and had to go back underground. Still, Irish neutrality kind of alienated from the rest of the world as they were seen as cowards. And it didn't help that President Amandine Valera was the first world leader to send his condolences to Germany after the death of Hitler. In return, the Irish troops that came back from the war were treated poorly and persecuted as they were seen as traitors who fought for their oppressors in a war they had no business in. This would lead to high tensions between the British and the Irish that in 1949, the Irish would finally leave the Commonwealth of Nations, thus becoming truly independent from Great Britain. But it would still have many problems to come later. We shall overcome. Now the 1950s were kind of a bad time for Ireland. It had to deal with economic stagnation and a second wave of emigration, but things were about to change for the better. In 1955, it was finally allowed to join the United Nations as it was banned because of its neutrality during World War II. And we looked to other European countries for support and joined the European Economic Community, the precursor to the European Union. The Irish economy began to boom and became a very small yet powerful country in Europe, being known as the Celtic Tiger and later the Celtic Phoenix. The same cannot be said for Northern Ireland as it was considered the poorer of the two Irelands. After the humiliating defeat they faced in World War II, the IRA's membership was on an all-time low with many people losing interest in the cause. So in 1956, the IRA would try one more attempt by attacking British and the Royal Ulster Constabulary, or the RUC forces. For six years, the IRA would try to gain the upper hand, but like many of their attempts, it ended in failure. Despite many Irish Catholics hating the United Kingdom as the Protestant majority would pass laws and discriminate against the Catholic minority, as many Catholics were segregated into lower jobs and poor neighborhoods, However, the Catholics also hated the IRA and thought their methods would lead them to disaster. So the Catholics tried a different approach. Inspired by the civil rights movement of the United States, many Catholics decided to please to protest against British rule, hoping for better rights. Along with that, a stop to gerrymandering and reform of the police force, the RUC, as police brutality was rampant in Northern Ireland as the Protestant policemen would target Catholics. Why does that sound familiar? In 1968, the first protest would begin, and when the police told the protesters to disperse, the protesters didn't listen, and the RUC began to beat them up. The Protestants would then frame the Catholics for crimes they didn't commit, but the civil rights movement kept going until one unfortunate day. On August 12, 1969, a Protestant organization called the Apprentice Boys marched through the Catholic-dominated Bogside neighborhood of Derry. 
As you can imagine, the Catholics didn't take too kindly to this and got into a fight with them. The RUC police ended up siding with the Apprentice Boys and only made the situation worse. And thus, a riot broke out and spread through Northern Ireland. From August 12 to August 16, all of Northern Ireland would be engulfed in riots, looting, and violence. It got so bad that the British Army had to get involved. And while at first the British were welcomed, once they sided with the Protestants, that's when all the goodwill left. And this was the beginning of the Troubles. The dying IRA would finally gain new life during the early years of the Troubles. Taking inspiration from the uniforms and nationalism of the Black Panther Party in the United States, and using the tactics of the Palestinian Liberation Organization in Israel, this IRA will become a force to be reckoned with. However, there would be a split inside the organization. You see, during the 1960s, more left-wing ideologies managed to make its way into the IRA, and thus there became two different factions. The Provisional IRA and the Official IRA. The Provisional IRA was more nationalistic, Catholic, and traditional, but with more democratic socialist ideas. The Provisional IRA would be supported by the North African country of Libya under the dictatorship of Muammar Gaddafi, along with sympathetic Irish-American groups and secretly Ireland itself, which we'll get more into that later. The Official IRA were just straight-up communists and they were supported by the Soviet Union and North Korea, thus turning Northern Ireland into another battlefield in the Cold War. As mentioned before, even Ireland almost got involved. In 1970, the Irish government and military made a plan to invade Northern Ireland to protect the Catholic population. It was called Operation Armageddon, and to the Irish people, it might as well have been Armageddon. You see, there was a lot of problems with this plan. For starters, the Irish didn't have the numbers to take on the British Army who, for the last 20 years, not only fought in World War II, but several other wars in former colonies such as Palestine, Kenya, Egypt, Malaysia, and even Northern Ireland. So many of these British troops were very experienced in combat. The best the Irish got were a bunch of UN peacekeepers who fought in the Congo during the early 1960s. Second, Britain had very powerful friends. It is a member of NATO which has stated if one country was attacked, its allies would get involved. This included West Germany, France, and especially the United States. And not to mention, many in the international community would have turned against Ireland for this action. And finally, Britain has nukes. Yeah, people tend to forget this, but the UK is a nuclear superpower with its own arsenal. Now granted, their supplies is not as big compared to Russia or America, but it's a pretty decent size. Now this is just an extreme example, I don't think the British would be crazy enough to launch a nuke on their own doorstep, but it just shows how outgunned and how outmatched the Irish were, so the plan was scrapped. Still, the Irish Civil Rights Movement would try to persist despite everything that happened, but unfortunately it would be stopped in its tracks. Literally. Between August 9th and 11, 1971, the British 1st Battalion Parachute Regiment killed 9 people in the Bella Murphy neighborhood of Belfast. And several months later, and on January 30th, 1972, those same exact British troops would kill 14 people and injure 15 in Derry as they would shoot at protesters who were trying to stop jailing without trial. This event would go on to be known as Bloody Sunday, and any thought of peaceful protests would end here. Recruitment and membership for the IRA soared after this terrible event. In response, Protestant loyalist paramilitary groups would form in response to the IRA, such as the Ulster Volunteer Force, the Redhead Commando, and the Gelenengue, which was made up of off-duty RUC and British officers. Because of their loyalist standings, you would think the British supported these paramilitary groups. Unofficially, yes. But in reality, a lot of them got their training and supplies from apartheid South Africa. Which, knowing how the Protestants treated the Catholics in Northern Ireland, this makes way too much sense. Here, not only these groups would clash in Northern Ireland, but in South Ireland, Britain, and even in mainland Europe. Speaking of which, a similar event was going on at the same time period in Italy, known as the Years of Lead, but that's a different story there. Bombings was basically everyone's form of attack, as both sides would use various forms of bombs to inflict casualties onto their enemies. The guerrilla warfare, mass shootings, and firefights were also common as well. There was even a brief hunger strike by IRA members in prison during the early 1980s. British politicians were not safe from the Troubles as a few of them were assassinated during this time period. 
The most well known was that of Earl Lewis Mountbatten, who was the last fast war of British India and responsible for the partition of South Asia. He was killed when the IRA struck the bomb onto his fishing boat. Let's just say I know some South Asians who were pretty happy about that one. Lord Anthony Barry, who was a conservative member of parliament and was a prominent player in Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher's cabinet, killed when an IRA bomb went off in his hotel, which was actually meant for the aforementioned Prime Minister Thatcher who barely escaped with her life as she was also the target for the assassination attempt in 1984. For 30 years, this mini civil war had a huge effect on Irish and British politics and society together, so much so that the Northern Irish border was considered one of the most dangerous borders in the world at the time. For 30 years, nationalists, loyalists, and British forces would fight among each other with many civilians getting caught in the crossfire until finally, in 1987, a ceasefire was enacted. After much negotiation and support from American President Bill Clinton, on April 10, 1998, the Good Friday Agreement would be established. This agreement would allow free travel between Ireland and Northern Ireland. Basically, it was a compromise to make all sides happy. For the Catholic Nationalists, they could move through Ireland whenever they please. For the British Loyalists, Northern Ireland would still be part of the United Kingdom. Unfortunately, as the saying goes, you can't make everyone happy. Like with that of the Treaty of 1922, the IRA had another split with disaffected members wanting all of Ireland to be united and free from British influence, and they would form the Real IRA. And in August 1998, the Real IRA would release a car bomb in the town of Ogma, killing 29 people and injuring 220. This turned the populace against the Real IRA as an attack after the Good Friday Agreement was seen as low. The Real IRA was seen as a pain for both sides as they were seen as causing trouble and sabotaging the Good Friday Agreement. Though despite their efforts, the agreement still worked out and there was relative peace in Ireland. Many IRA members were going to be politicians of the Sinn Féin party as the party was finally unbanned in Northern Ireland and it seemed like things were only getting better. But as you can tell, something's going to throw a big monkey wrench into this whole peace process. So on June 23rd, 2016, the United Kingdom in a very close race voted to leave the European Union. Now I'm not going into the whole thing about the politics of the EU because God knows as an American I can't get it right. But look at this map right here. With the exception of London, as you can see, Wales and England overwhelmingly voted to leave. Scotland said they wanted to stay, which they're pissed off about and they're kind of dealing with their own thing. But look at Northern Ireland. As you can see, most of them overwhelmingly said to stay. And this is where things get messy. So during the Brexit negotiations, no one paid any attention to Northern Ireland, and this made many Northern Irish feel left out. But there's another problem. Remember the Good Friday Agreement? Well, the reason why that was able to work is that the UK and Ireland were both EU members. But now that the UK was out of the EU, tensions would come back. So at the time this video is being made, the UK and the EU are trying to compromise by establishing the Northern Ireland Protocol which will still allow for some free travel along with trades and goods to come between the two Irelands and the new border would be the Irish Sea. However, this did not go well with many Protestant loyalists with riots popping up across the country. And even in London, the Parliament are arguing among themselves on how they should do the Northern Ireland Protocol. On May 7, 2022, Sinn Féin had a historic win as they managed to get the majority of seats in the Northern Ireland Assembly for the first time. Not to mention, another first is that the Catholics have outnumbered the Protestants with currently 46% of the population in Northern Ireland being Catholic, while 43% being Protestant. This has many loyalists worried that this will lead to a united Ireland and many are preparing for the worst. So no one knows what the future holds for Northern Ireland, but many are fearing a return to the Troubles. And that right there friends is the revolutionary history of Ireland. As you can see, the Irish have been fighting against British influence for the longest time, and if things don't go well, sadly this fight will still keep going on. All because one king let his pride get the best of him. <laughs> 